thank you, Brother Jay, for leading us those songs. Again, uh, you might think it's uh, a little redundant for him to get up here and lead songs, wave his arms, but we're trying to make this as much a normal uh, service as possible. We want your life to be as normal as it possibly can be in such an abnormal time. You know, one of the problems that uh, I face as a preacher and as a pastor is to strike a balance in my preaching, because in a time of crisis, uh, the tendency is to just uh, uh, preach messages that provide comfort to people and help them overcome the fears that are, and that's necessary. But I want to use this time in a way that I think God intends it to be used as well, and that is, I want to use this crisis as a time to encourage people to get right with God. I want us to be right with God. I want to be right with God myself. I want you to be right with God as well. And uh, one of the benefits that I think we should be uh, taking advantage of in having to spend more time at home. You're isolated, right? You're at home, right? Is that you can spend more time with the Lord than you ever have had the ability to. Take advantage of that. More personal time with God. And there are two very basic parts of spending time with God. Important, ingre uh, important ingredients of doing so. And those two things are very, uh, I think, elementary. You're, you're probably already thinking what they are. And that is Bible reading and prayer. Two very vital ingredients of spending time with God. But how do these things relate to each other? Would you turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 9? Turn to Daniel chapter 9 tonight, and I want to show you how in this passage, reading the Bible and prayer come together. They, they mix, and uh, they overlap. I want to share that with you after we pause for just a brief word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to be back here tonight. We want to thank you that your word is what we need because your word is true, your word that the Spirit desires in our lives. And we pray tonight that you would open each one's heart to this passage in the word of God, the Bible. And I pray that you will make the individual application and that you would make this a blessed time together and uh, bring that balance that is so necessary in a time of crisis like this in our thinking, in our living, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look first in the, uh, uh, the two verses that begin this ninth chapter. If you look with me, it says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish Seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. I find this interesting in many ways. But one way is that here is a Bible writer himself, Daniel the prophet. And Daniel the prophet is reading his Bible. He's reading the books. He's reading the scrolls. He's reading the Tanakh. He's reading the scriptures. And as he does, God speaks to him. 
he hears God speak through his Bible reading. I wonder if you hear God speak through your reading of the Bible. I hope you read the Bible. And if you do, it makes no sense to read the Bible if you don't hear God speaking to you through it. But if you're going to hear God speak to you through the Bible like Daniel did, you not only have to read it, but you have to read it with listening ears. You have to read it with undivided attention. You know what I hate? One thing, one of my pet peeves is I hate speaking to people when they're really not listening to me, when maybe they're doing something else. If a family member is perhaps on a device when I'm trying to speak to them about something, that bothers me. And I, and I say, put the device down, listen. So much more important when we talk about the Word of God, that we give God's Word our undivided attention. And uh, it's a message, this message that I want to share with you tonight is really the result of two different people in this congregation that shared with me, uh, without uh, collusion between themselves, that God spoke to them out of Daniel chapter 9. And I said, well, if God spoke to two different people who did not speak to each other about it, from Daniel chapter 9, maybe God has a message for me and for all of us from Daniel chapter 9. And so that's why we're here tonight. Because God spoke to them, two people in this congregation, and in doing so, I heard it. They shared with me what God spoke to them about, and I heard it, and it drove me to Daniel chapter 9. And that's why we're here. You see, this is exactly what's going on in this passage. There's Bible reading happening, God speaking, Daniel's hearing what God says, and he's sharing then what God says with God's people. This is called illumination. The first two verses of Daniel 9. Here's a prophet. He is the one that God has used to reveal truth to his people. But he's reading God's word. God reveals truth to him. The same way that God reveals truth to us. Isn't that amazing? It's an ancient method. Here is a prophet reading the Word of God. God gives him insight into, uh, into understanding the Scripture, and he shares it with others. That is an experience that I want you to have on a regular basis, that I want, that uh, we experience God bringing truth to our attention through our regular Bible reading. You'll miss it if you're not a regular Bible reader. A daily time in the Word of God to know what God's plan is, to successfully navigate through life, especially when it's perilous, especially when it's a time of crisis, how much more you need time spent in God. You know, God has something to say to you every day. God wants to speak to you every day. God wants to reveal truth to you. He has something individually to say to you. And that is called illumination. But when God illuminates, when God gives you spiritual insight from the reading of the Word of God, the second verse is, he understood it. And you understand it, you get this insight from reading when you contemplate. So illumination has to become contemplation. Daniel read the prophecies, and he thought about what he was reading. His mind wasn't wandering in different directions. He wasn't thinking about what he was going to do uh, in a few hours or the next day. He was focused on what God's Word was saying to him in that passage at that moment. He was meditating upon that, and as a result, verse 2 said, he gained understanding from God. Illumination with contemplation brings great understanding from God. You know what? I thought about this. If I were the devil, I would try to get Christians preoccupied with other things. If I were the devil, 
I would try to keep Christians, believers, from being seriously involved with the Word of God. If I were the devil, I would try to get Christians to be spiritually starved and to become spiritually ignorant of what the Bible says. The prophet gains illumination through his contemplation. And look at the result of it in the third verse. Daniel says, as a result of that illumination, by contemplation, I set my face upon or unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. It led to stimulation. Serious Bible reading will prompt and will provoke you to fervent prayer. That's what he did. He was provoked to fervent prayer. Meditating on God's Word is a big part of praying effectually because it takes time. You have to think about what God says. You have to connect the spiritual dots, the practical truth to be applied to your life. And that's what prayer is about. God wants you to know his truth so that when you pray, you can claim that truth. So that you can pray intelligently, biblically. God wants you to know the truth of God's word so that you can claim the promises that he gives to you in his word. God wants you to know his word that you might claim it so that God can work them on the basis of your biblical prayers, on the basis of your biblically asking God according to his direction. So, two parts of the Christian life. Bible reading, the second part that we see him stimulated to do is prayer. And I want to tell you that Daniel chapter 9, no joke, is one of the most striking prayers in the entire Bible. Here he is speaking to God about what God spoke to him about. That's what prayer is, folks. Prayer is turning your Bible reading, uh, is turning your Bible reading into speaking with God. Prayer is like Daniel speaking to God about what God spoke to you about through your Bible time. That means that your prayers are going to be Bible-based. And in verses 3 to 14, his prayer is first and foremost a prayer of confession. Let's quickly look through these verses. In uh, verse 4, I prayed unto the... By the way, verse 3, why does he fast? Why does he have sackcloth or burlap and ashes on himself? Because those are all signs of grief. Those are signs of mourning. Those are signs of sorrow. And it's a sorrow over sin. As you see him confessing, verse 4, I prayed unto the Lord my God, and I made my confession and said, O oh Lord, the great and awesome God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Notice this, we have sinned. Now, I don't know anywhere in the Bible that says any specific sin that Daniel was guilty of. I know Daniel was a man. I know that Daniel sinned. But the Bible doesn't specify any sin of Daniel, and yet he includes himself in this prayer of confession. He says, we have sinned. And when we pray for ourselves, we must begin right there in confession. And we must, even when we pray for the sins of our city, or we pray for the sins of our country, or we pray for the sins of this world, we must include ourselves. He says, we have sinned, verse 5, and we have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. 
neither notice this, have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. O oh, Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion or shame of face, as in the day uh, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, all that are near and all that are far off, through all the countries which thou hast driven them because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. O oh, Lord, to us, notice again, goes the self, to us belongs confusion or shame on our face. To our kings, our princes, our rulers, to our fathers, our ancestors, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord to walk in his law, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him, and he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges, and judged us by bringing upon us a great evil, for under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. Do you get the picture? God, we're all guilty. We are all equally guilty. God, we've sinned. And there is a repeating and a repeating and a repeating. You know what the prerequisite for getting right with God is and for being restored by God? It's confession. It's owning it. It's owning up to it. He's basically saying, Lord, we got ourselves in a big mess. We're at, in captivity for 70 years because of our own sin. The first thing he does is he owns it himself. And then he talks about the sin of God's people, but includes himself in the group. He knew his own unworthiness. To know your own unworthiness, your own guiltiness before God, is honesty and it's humility and that really is the beginning of effectual prayer in which God's people are enabled to identify with sinful people I remember the prophet Isaiah when he saw the Lord he was smitten by the glory and the holiness of God and he said, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And then he says, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. But before he saw the people as sinners, he saw himself as a wicked sinner. I'm unclean. And by grace, we put ourselves in the same moral circumstances as the people that we want to pray for. And you know what? That's how we need to view, our, and that's how we need to pray for the people in this city. That's how we need to pray for the people in this country. That's how we need to pray for those people, perhaps, that lead us, that maybe we despise. That's how we need to pray. There is a real contrast in those verses between God's people and God. He says, to us belong sin, to us belong guilt. To us belongs shame, but to God belongs righteousness. In other words, what he's doing in bringing us judgment and captivity is that's righteous on his part. To God belongs righteousness, but to God thankfully belongs mercy and forgiveness. Basically, his prayer, he's saying, you know what? We all got precisely what we deserved. God's people got so precisely what they were warned about, and they ignored that warning, and they ignored what God said would happen if they turned away from him, and uh, if they refused to cry out to him, they got exactly what God said they would get. 
It shouldn't be any surprise to us, should it? Do we think really honestly that we are more righteous than those ancient Jewish people of old? Do we think that we have done better than they? And I'm talking about us, God's people. Do we think that we have been more faithful to God than they have? Let's be honest and let's be humble about this. Do we think really that we deserve better treatment than what we are experiencing? But I want to quickly, I want to end on this note. That prayer in verse 15 down to verse 19 turns from confession to what I call intercession. Five times in this passage, the word supplication is mentioned. That word supplication is a word for prayer. It means to ask God for favor, to have favor in God's eyes because of some need that you have. So five times the word supplication is used in this passage that we're looking at tonight. But it is supplication. It is asking God's favor, not for yourself, not Daniel for himself, but Daniel is supplicating or asking for God's favor for the people, for others. And when we pray for others, that is called intercession. That is interceding between God and people on their behalf and not our own behalf. And the basis for this intercession is obviously it can't be that Daniel is pleading, interceding for these people uh, for either his own or the people's sake. You read these verses. Let's look at them. Verse 15. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has gotten thee renowned as at this day. We have sinned. We have done wickedly. O oh Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, I beg thee, let thine anger, thy fury be turned away from the city of Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for our iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, verse 17. Oh, our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. Oh, my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the cry which is called by thy name, the city that is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hearken and, and defer not for thine own sake. O oh my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name intercession. Look at the basis of it. He can't plead. He can't plead on the basis of his own or his people's sake. His cry is, it's based, first of all, on the relationship that God has to his people. That's number one. And then his cry is based upon God's past deliverance. He talks about Egypt and how God did such glorious things and made a reputation for himself when he delivered by his strong hand out of Egypt. And he pleads on the basis of God's righteousness, on the basis of what God has promised Israel, what God's promised plan and purpose is for this people. And he pleads on the basis of God's mercy. God, do this for your sake, not ours. Do it for your sake. Do it, God, on the basis of your mercy. That's real intercession. But that intercession, that basis of it, is the result of a burden. Don't you hear the burden of Daniel in this prayer? What a deep burden he has. One of the greatest marks 
of praying in the Holy Spirit is that you pray with more concern than other, for others than you do for yourself. All hinges on God and uh, uh, all hinges on God being able to identify just one person that would intercede on the behalf of the people. Ezekiel, I sought for a man, God said, to stand in the gap, and I found none. Isaiah 59, sought for an intercessor, didn't find one. So my own arm, God said, was made bare. Intercession, that's what God's looking for. No one, I, I, I want to say this. Here's what I mean by a burden that becomes intercession, prayer for others. Think of it this way. No human being chooses to exist. Every person begins existence in someone else's body. Now, a woman can't impregnate herself. You know what intercession is? Bible intercession is that we become spiritual moms. We become spiritual mothers. You remember how Paul put it in Galatians 4.19 about the Galatians? He said, I prevail over you until Christ be formed in you. Galatians 4.19. Intercession is a burden. It's when God's people become impregnated by the Holy Spirit of God and they pray with groaning labor pains that brings forth, that, that births spiritual results. There's too many miscarriages. There's too many abortions in the intercession industry. And you know why? Because Self-interest always replaces God's desires and God's will. Well, I want you to see what the result of his intercession is. It says in verse 20, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation or sacrifice, and he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Intervention. That's what happened. He got an answer. And it was so much more than he asked for. God is undelayed and God totally responds to Daniel's prayer and informs him about God's future program for the nation of Israel. I want to say this, that through a personal time with God, let the Holy Spirit put his groans in you. Ask God to give you his vision, his will for you and for others, and then enter into that with faith, and with his faith, I should say, and the passion that he wants to give you. Ask God, is this what comes out of your heart that you're letting me share in? You know what the greatest fulfillment in life is? I've discovered it. It's being a part, being a small part. It's being a part of fulfilling God's desires and God's will on this earth. That's what fulfillment in life is. I want to share... Uh, in closing, just one illustration. In the summer of 1876, grasshoppers nearly destroyed the crops in uh, 
the state of Minnesota. So, in the spring of 1877, the farmers were very worried. And they believed that this dreadful grasshopper plague would, would uh, visit them again and, and would again destroy their, their whole wheat crop, uh, bringing, of course, uh, ruin and poverty to thousands of people. The situation was so serious that the governor of uh, Minnesota proclaimed April 26 as a day of prayer and fasting. And Governor Pillsbury urged every man, woman, and child to ask God to prevent the, this terrible scourge of grasshoppers. And on April 26, on that day, all schools, shops, stores, and offices were closed. And there was a reverent, quiet hush over the whole state. The next day it was a bright, clear day. The temperature just soared to what to, was ordinary there. And there was an unusual heat wave then that for that uh, time in April, and Minnesotians were devastated because they discovered when they looked that there were billions of grasshopper larvae wiggling to life. For three days, the unusual heat increased and the larva hatched. And it appeared that it wouldn't be long before they started feeding and destroying the entire wheat crop. But on the fourth day, the temperature suddenly dropped. And that night, there was frost that covered the entire state. And the result of that, it killed every single grasshopper. And it went down in history of Minnesota as the day that God answered the prayers of the people. I wonder what God would do in this state, in this city, in this country, if God's people would get serious. Like Daniel prayed that we would pray, that we would begin with confession, that we would then uh, include intercession. I wonder what kind of intervention we'd see God do. This is the connection between Bible reading and prayer. If our Bible reading doesn't get us to that kind of praying, we need to get back into the Word, that we might then get back on our knees. Let's pray. Our Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity that we've had just to meditate a few minutes in this wonderful prayer of Daniel the prophet. But Lord, may it not be forgotten. May we not, may we meditate on, and may it end up driving us to real intercessory prayer for our city, our state, our country, our world. We pray, O oh God, that you would impregnate us with the burden that you have, the work that you want to do through your people here on this earth. May your will be done on earth, we pray in Jesus' name.